Welcome to another installment of Christmas in Quarantine, its Christmas Past's impromptu miniseries of indeterminate length. Today is day 14 of these daily episodes, and we'll keep them going until things are looking better on the COVID-19 crisis. Today we are returning to the world of classic Christmas stories. And just like the last story that I shared, this one is going out by special request. As a matter of fact, a couple of people requested this story, including Michael in Illinois. And Michael wants to say hi. Hello, fellow Christmas Past listeners. My name is Michael, and I'm from Arlington Heights, Illinois. I absolutely love hearing about the origins of different Christmas traditions, along with old-time stories. I live with my wife and two boys, four and six. My wife, thankfully, is able to work from home. Without school or daycare, it has fallen upon myself to care for our kids. I'm trying to make the best of it with homeschooling, but it's a very, very difficult task. We only have gone through about one full week now, and I feel as though it's been months. We are practicing social distancing, and I hope everyone else is taking it seriously. Thanks very much. I'd love to share your message with the Christmas Past family. Any well wishes, tips, shout outs, anything at all that you want to share, just record a voice memo on your phone and send it over to christmaspastpodcast at gmail.com. Before we get to the story, as always, I hope that you are staying safe and healthy, that you're practicing all of the common sense guidelines, that you're treating the situation with the seriousness it deserves, and that you're taking your advice only from trained medical professionals. Now, today's story is from Charles Dickens's The Posthumous Papers of the Pickwick Club, also commonly known as the Pickwick Papers. There's a section of three stories in the Pickwick Papers that have also been published as their own edition titled Mr. Pickwick's Christmas. One of those stories, the one that you're about to hear, is The Story of the Goblins Who Stole the Sexton. I'm going to break it up into two parts. Part one today, part two tomorrow. So, get yourself nice and cozy, because it's story time. In an old abbey town in this part of the country, a long, long while ago, so long ago that the story must be a true one because our great-grandfathers implicitly believed it, there officiated as sexton and gravedigger in the churchyard one Gabriel Grubb. It by no means follows that because a man is a sexton and constantly surrounded by emblems of mortality, therefore he should be a morose and melancholy man. Your undertakers are the merriest fellows in the world, and I once had the honor of being on intimate terms with a mute who in private life and off-duty was as comical and jocose a little fellow as ever chirped out a devil-may-care song without a hitch in his memory or drained off a good stiff glass of grog without stopping for breath. But notwithstanding these precedents to the contrary, Gabriel Grubb was an ill-conditioned, cross-grained, surly fellow a morose and lonely man who consorted with nobody but himself and an old wicker bottle which fitted into his large deep waistcoat pocket, and who eyed each merry face as it passed him by with such a deep scowl of malice and ill humor as it was difficult to meet without feeling something the worse for. A little before twilight one Christmas Eve, Gabriel shouldered his spade, lighted his lantern, and betook himself toward the old churchyard, for he had got a grave to finish by next morning and feeling very low, he thought it might raise his spirits, perhaps, if he went on with his work at once. As he wended his way up the ancient street, he saw the cheerful light of the blazing fires gleam through the old casements, and heard the loud laugh and cheerful shouts of those who were assembled around them. He marked the bustling preparations for the next day's good cheer, and smelt the numerous savory odors consequent thereupon as they steamed up from the kitchen windows in clouds. All this was gall and wormwood to the heart of Gabriel Grubb. And as groups of children bounded out of the houses, tripped across the road, and were met before they could knock at the opposite door by half a dozen curly-headed little rascals who crowded round them as they flocked upstairs and spent the evenings in their Christmas games, Gabriel smiled grimly and clutched the handle of his spade with a firmer grasp as he thought of measles, scarlet fever, thrush, whooping cough, and a good many other sources of consolation beside. In this happy frame of mind, Gabriel strode along, returning a short sullen scowl to the good-humored greetings of such of his neighbors as now and then passed him, until he turned into the dark lane which led to the churchyard. 
Now, Gabriel had been looking forward to reaching the Dark Lane because it was, generally speaking, a nice, gloomy, mournful place into which the townspeople did not much care to go, except in broad daylight when the sun was shining. Consequently, he was not a little indignant to hear a young urchin roaring out some jolly song about a Merry Christmas in this very sanctuary, which had been called Coffin Lane ever since the days of the old abbey and the time of the shaven-headed monks. As Gabriel walked on and the voice drew nearer, he found it proceeded from a small boy who was hurrying along to join one of the little parties on the old street, and who, partly keeping himself company and partly to prepare himself for the occasion, was shouting out the song at the highest pitch of his lungs. So Gabriel waited till the boy came up and then dodged him into a corner and wrapped him over the head with his lantern five or six times just to teach him to modulate his voice. And as the boy hurried away with his hand to his head singing quite a different sort of tune, Gabriel Grubb chuckled very heartily to himself and entered the churchyard locking the gate behind him. He took off his coat, set down his lantern, and getting into the unfinished grave worked at it for an hour or so, with right good will. But the earth was hardened with the frost and it was no easy matter to break it up and shovel it out. And although there was a moon, it was a very young one and shed little light upon the grave, which was in the shadow of the church. At any other time, these obstacles would have made Gabriel Grubb very moody and miserable, but he was so well pleased with having stopped the small boy's singing that he took little heed of the scanty progress he had made and looked down into the grave when he had finished work for the night with grim satisfaction, murmuring as he gathered up his things. Brave lodgings for one, brave lodgings for one, a few feet of cold earth when life is done, a stone at the head, a stone at the feet, a rich juicy meal for the worms to eat, rank grass overhead and damp clay around, brave lodgings for one, these in holy ground. Ho ho, laughed Gabriel Grubb as he sat himself down on a flat tombstone, which was a favorite resting place of his, and drew forth his wicker bottle. A coffin at Christmas. A Christmas box, ho ho ho. Ho ho ho, repeated a voice which sounded close behind him. Gabriel paused in some alarm in the act of raising the wicker bottle to his lips and looked around. The bottom of the oldest grave about him was not more still and quiet than the churchyard in the pale moonlight. The cold hoar frost glistened on the tombstones and sparkled like rows of gems among the stone carvings of the old church. The snow lay hard and crisp upon the ground, and spread over the thickly strewn mounds of earth so white and smooth a cover that it seemed as if corpses lay there, hidden only by their winding sheets. Not the faintest rustle broke the profound tranquility of the solemn scene. Sound itself appeared to be frozen up, all was so cold and still. It was the echoes, said Gabriel Grubb, raising the bottle to his lips again. It was not, said a deep voice. Gabriel started up and stood rooted to the spot with astonishment and terror, for his eyes rested on a form which made his blood run cold. Seated on an upright tombstone, close to him was a strange, unearthly figure, whom Gabriel felt at once was no being of this world. His long, fantastic legs, which might have reached the ground, were cocked up and crossed after a quaint, fantastic fashion. His sinewy arms were bare, and his hands rested on his knees. On his short, round body he wore a close covering, ornamented with small slashes, and a short cloak dangled at his back. The collar was cut into curious peaks, which served the goblin in lieu of ruff or neckerchief, and his shoes curled up at the toes into long points. On his head he wore a broad-brimmed sugarloaf hat, garnished with a single feather. The hat was covered with the white frost, and the goblin looked as if he had sat on the same tombstone very comfortably for two or three hundred years. He was sitting perfectly still. His tongue was put out as if by derision, and he was grinning at Gabriel Grubb with such a grin as only a goblin could call up. It was not the echoes, said the goblin. Gabriel Grubb was paralyzed. He could not make a reply. What do you do here on a Christmas Eve? said the goblin sternly. I came to dig a grave, sir, stammered Gabriel Grubb. What man wanders among graves and churchyards on such a night as this? said the goblin. 
Gabriel Grubb, Gabriel Grubb, screamed a wild chorus of voices that seemed to fill the churchyard. Gabriel looked fearfully around. Nothing was to be seen. What have you got in that bottle? said the goblin. Hollands, sir, replied the sexton, trembling more than ever, for he had bought it of the smugglers, and he thought that perhaps his questioner might be in the excise department of the goblins. Who drinks Hollands alone and in a churchyard on such a night as this? said the goblin. Gabriel Grubb, Gabriel Grubb, exclaimed the wild voices again. The goblin leered maliciously at the terrified sexton and then, raising his voice, exclaimed, And who, then, is our fair and lawful prize? To this inquiry, the invisible chorus replied, in a strain that sounded like the voices of many choristers singing to the mighty swell of the old church organ, a strain that seemed borne to the sexton's ears upon a gentle wind and to die away as its soft breath passed onward, but the burden of the reply was still the same. Gabriel Grubb, Gabriel Grubb. The goblin grinned a broader grin than before as he said, Well, Gabriel, what do you say to this? The sexton gasped for breath. What do you think of this, Gabriel? said the goblin, kicking up his feet in the air on either side of the tombstone and looking at the turned up points with as much complacency as if he had been contemplating the most fashionable pair of Wellingtons in all Bond Street. It's, it's very curious, sir, replied the sexton, half dead with fright. Very curious and very pretty, but I think I'll go back and finish my work, sir, if you please. Work, said the goblin. What work? The grave, sir, making the grave, stammered the sexton. Oh, the grave, eh, said the goblin. Who makes graves at a time when all other men are merry and takes a pleasure in it? Again, the mysterious voices replied, Gabriel Grubb, Gabriel Grubb. I'm afraid my friends want you, Gabriel, said the goblin, thrusting his tongue further into his cheek than ever, and a most astonishing tongue it was. I'm afraid my friends want you, Gabriel, said the goblin. Under favor, sir, replied the horror-struck sexton. I don't think they can, sir. They don't know me, sir. I don't think the gentlemen have ever seen me, sir. Oh, yes, they have, replied the goblin. We know the man with the sulky face and the grim scowl that came down the street tonight throwing his evil looks at the children and grasping his burying spade the tighter. We know the man that struck the boy in the envious malice of his heart because the boy could be merry and he could not. We know him. We know him. Here the goblin gave a loud, shrill laugh that the echoes returned twenty-fold, and throwing his legs up into the air, stood upon his head, or rather upon the very point of his sugarloaf hat, on the narrow edge of the tombstone, from whence he threw a somersault with extraordinary agility right to the sexton's feet, at which he planted himself in the attitude in which tailors generally sit upon the shop aboard. I, I am afraid I must leave you, sir, said the sexton, making an effort to move. Leave us? said the goblin. Gabriel Grubb going to leave us? Ho, ho, ho. Well, looks like poor Gabriel has found himself in a bind. You'll have to come back again tomorrow for part two, the conclusion of the story, to find out what happens. Thanks again to everyone who recommended that I read this. A lot of these classic stories I'm bringing you during Christmas in quarantine are new to me too. I may have been vaguely aware that they existed, but I'm reading them for the first time right here with you. Until we meet again, let me remind you as always that Christmas Past is produced in sunny San Mateo, California by yours truly, Brian Earle. You can reach out anytime at christmaspastpodcast at gmail.com or find me on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And if you haven't yet joined the private Christmas Past Facebook group, maybe today's the day you will. If you're enjoying these Christmas in Quarantine episodes, I have a feeling you have some friends and family in your life who could also use a little Christmas spirit during these uncertain times. So why not help more people discover the show? It's as simple as telling a friend about it or leaving a review on Apple Podcasts. Those are both quick and painless ways to show support that take less than a minute, but they really do make a big difference. And if you do leave a review on Apple Podcasts, I'll even send you a Christmas Past sticker and a handwritten Christmas card as my way of saying thanks. Reach out for details about that. Until tomorrow, stay safe and healthy, look out for one another, and may your days be merry and bright.